Okay. Now, I will look into the broad legal and ethical issues and conflicts. What is the basis for confidentiality? What is the basis that we must respect what the patients tell us and not reveal it to others? There's the law, there's the ethics, and then there's plain common sense. Plain common sense is if a patient comes to us and they don't feel they can share everything about themselves to us, then very often we won't be able to get all the information necessary to treat that person, that patient optimally. And it is part and parcel of respect for each other. When somebody tells something in confidence to us, it is basic respect that we keep that information in confidence. Okay, so the law, we look at a Personal Data Protection Act, Section 13. An organization must not collect, use, or disclose personal data about an individual unless the individual gives or is deemed to have given his or her consent under this act to the collection, use, or disclosure, as the case may be. Or the collection, use, or disclosure without the individual's consent is required or authorized under this act or any other written law. So the PDPA does have provision to say, well, when there are other laws which uh, either mandate or permit disclosure, then the PDPA is overridden. <clears throat> Section 24, an organization must protect personal data in its possession or under its control by making reasonable security arrangements to prevent unauthorized access, collection, use, disclosure, copying, modification, or disposure, or disposal, or similar risks and the loss of any storage medium or device on which personal data is stored. So there's quite a lot of onus to ensure that personal data, what should be kept confidential, the organization involved must take all reasonable steps to ensure that that takes place. Retention of personal data, an organization must cease to retain its documents containing personal data or removes the means by which the personal data can be associated with particular individuals as soon as it is reasonable to assume that the purpose for which that personal data was collected is no longer being served by retention of the personal data and retention is no longer necessary for legal or business purposes. For those of us who look after patients, of course, we do need to keep the patient records for a certain period of time, whether it is in anticipation that a patient may come back or if we are concerned there might be a medical legal issue. So of course we don't immediately dispose of uh, personal data. We need to keep it. PDPA does not cover uh, what is important to understand, realize, it does not impose any obligation on any public agency. It, is, it only covers private organizations. Then there is the common law principle. Bear in mind, common law applies to everybody. PDPA, as I pointed out, applies only to private organizations. And this common law principle uh, does come from England. When it comes from England, what we do have to bear in mind is that Singapore does not automatically follow English law, but when there is no common law principle laid down in Singapore law, we look to the English law for guidance. So this is highly likely to be what the law in Singapore is. Uh, and essentially, this comes from a specific case, AG and Guardian Newspapers Limited. What it says, or what came out of that case, is that when a person receives 
information under notice of confidentiality, under circumstances where a reasonable person ought to know the information is confidential, then the law says the legal principle is that you must keep the information confidential. And this applies not only to medical material, but to anyone, everyone. This is a particular newspaper case. In terms of uh, medical, a doctor, uh, this is another specific case, hunter and man. The doctor is under a duty not to voluntarily disclose without the consent of the patient information which he, the doctor, has gained in his professional capacity. So that is very clear. Uh, the case has stated that and like I said earlier, even beyond the law, it is pure common sense that we ought to be respecting patient confidentiality. All the codes of ethics also talk about it, whether it's Hippocratic Oath, International Code of Ethics, GMC Guidelines, SMC Physicians Pledge, where it says, I solemnly pledge to respect the secrets which are confided in me. Our SMC, Singapore Medical Council, Ethical Code and Ethical Guidelines, talks about privacy as well. Uh, the attitude towards patients, you must always respect patients' right to privacy and dignity. And then in terms of medical confidentiality, patients have a right to expect that any information provided to you in the context of clinical care be kept confidential unless there are very good reasons for sharing the information. Of course, when the law mandates that we have to share the information, that is a very good reason. So we ask that question, are they conflicting duties? And the answer is, yes, they are. The duty to patients to protect their privacy and confidentiality, um, it is part of the welfare, both physical and mental, to the patient, that they know that whatever whether history, examination that has been done is kept confidential. And it's important, especially to vulnerable populations, because they might not be able to understand fully, they might not have the power to, to, to say, no, I don't want something done. But there are the provisions there which make reporting mandatory. Then, of course, the duty re to report. We talked about reportable offences under Section 424 CPC, Penal Code, Infectious Diseases, Misuse of Drugs Regulations as some examples. The Infectious Diseases Act, I will touch on a little bit more in a, in, in a short while. So we're looking at individual rights and autonomy, which is a public interest in itself, versus greater public interest which mandate and or permit breach of confidentiality in specific circumstances. So this is the next scenario. You are a GP in private practice. A patient with known history of bipolar disorder consults you for treatment of penile discharge. He tells you his wife has been cheating on him has now inflicted a sexually transmitted disease on him. He is convinced she's out to harm him, needs to get rid of her before she causes him more serious harm. He says he has a sharp knife just for such purposes. You are worried her intention to harm her is real. He refuses further investigation for his penile discharge, but it appears to be due to gonorrhea. He asks you to treat him and clarifies that all consultations are strictly confidential. So, if it's not strictly confidential, that does put us as healthcare practitioners in a difficult situation, in a dilemma. Let's see what the law says about a context like this. First off, there's a the case of Tarasov. Tarasov, bear in mind, is a case that comes from the USA, but it is a common law case. It's a common law case from a long time ago, 1976. And for all intents and purposes, 
it appears that the common law, all the common law jurisdictions accept it because there have not been any statements which are contrary or say that, hey, we don't, we don't accept the principles laid down in Tarasov. What happened in Tarasov? There was this particular lady, Tatiana Tarasov. Uh, she had a New Year's Eve dance with this chap called Prosenjit Poda, who fancied her. But she evidently didn't fancy him. And she would reject all his invitations to go out with him, do stuff with him. This chap Prasenjit Poda, he uh, um, confessed to the therapist in the university, in the university they were both in. So Tarasov was an undergraduate, Prasenjit Poda, a postgrad student. Uh, he, Prasenjit needed therapy with a psychologist and he confessed to the th therapist's intention to harm the woman. And the therapist actually contacted the campus police, but the campus police decided he was not a danger. Uh, to cut a long story short, he killed her. And uh, the family successfully sued the employers of the therapist for failure to take preventive action, for failure to detain him or to stop him from do doing this act. So the principle laid down disclosure other action as necessary required of healthcare professional to avert threatened harm. If we think through this scenario, what is the other Singapore law that would apply to this particular context? It would be what I talked about just now, Section 424 of the Criminal Procedure Code. Because this person has indicated that he wants to kill someone, which is an arrestable offence. So the difference between Tarasov and Section 424 Criminal Procedure Code, Tarasov is saying that the person made aware of such an intention must inform the potential victim and avert and do what is necessary to prevent that harm from occurring. Section 424 says you must inform the police. So there are two different uh, principles, if you like, but they're similar. This principle of greater public interest um, has been laid down in case law. This is an English case, particular case of W and Agdell. In this case, a prisoner in a high security facility, he had killed something like 11 people in a, in a shooting rampage. He sought review of his case and wanted transfer to a lower security facility. But the independent psychiatrist which his counsel uh, uh, engaged gave an unfavorable report opinion. So they decided not to submit the report. The psychiatrist found out about it. He felt that this patient person was a danger or still presented a danger to the public. So he sent the report to the hospital medical director, copied to the home office. When the prisoner found out, he was of course angry and action was brought in contract and equity against psychiatrists for breach of confidence. But it, essentially, the, the, what the courts decided, the real risk to public safety entitled the doctor to convey concern to appropriate authorities. Bear in mind, in this context, it is entitled, that means it permits, it's not a must. So it permits the doctor to breach confidentiality. And the principles laid down, there must be serious risk of danger to the public, such that it overrides the strong public interest of maintaining confidentiality. Disclosure is limited to those with legitimate interests, only minimum information that is required to protect the public. Uh, another principle that they, that they did talk about and lay down is that disclosure is not automatic upon police request. So the police needs to give you evidence. If a police comes to ask you for information on a person, they need to give you evidence or a, a, a statement why, why they, are, they 
they are entitled to that information. Then our uh, Singapore Medical Council Ethical Code and Ethical Guidelines also talks about disclosure. You must have sound justifications if you decide to disclose patient information without consent. Disclosure without consent is generally defensible when it is mandated by law. I would say it's beyond generally defensible. It is mandated by law means we have to do it. It is necessary in order to protect patients or others from harm when the involvement of parents and legal guardians is beneficial to minors or where such disclosure is in the patient's best interest. What I'll do now is just briefly touch on the Infectious Diseases Act and it's to show that principle. The Infectious Diseases Act is a very good illustration of the principle where greater public interest supersedes the individual right to privacy, confidentiality. So the Infectious Diseases Act is an act relating to quarantine and the prevention of infectious diseases. It includes provisions for contact tracing, quarantine, prevention programs, restrictions, which uh, we have very recently experienced in relation to COVID. So it is an example of an act that illustrates how greater public interest trumps personal autonomy and rights. There's a whole list of infectious diseases in the act which uh, a medical practitioner who, if we have reason to believe or suspect that a person attended to or treated by him is suffering from that disease, we have to notify the director within the time prescribed in the Infectious Diseases Act. And uh, gonorrhea is an example of such a case, of such a disease. So in this particular example, not just do we have to inform the potential victim, not just do we have to inform the police, we have to notify of this possible or likely infectious disease as well. So section 21A uh, talks about dangerous infectious diseases of which COVID is one and there's a list of these others and there are these provisions where this, the, anyone who has or has reason to suspect he has such diseases has these restrictions which I will leave everyone to read through yourself. Then there are specific provisions in terms of HIV, uh, whether it is that the person who knows or has HIV infection must not engage in any sexual activity with another person unless before that sexual activity takes place, he informs that other person of the risks of contracting HIV uh, and that person has voluntarily agreed to accept that risk. Then there are other provisions in there. Again, I will leave you to read through it yourself. Uh, disclosure by Director General or Medical Practitioner. So there are provisions in the Infectious Diseases Act to say a medical practitioner may disclose information relating to any person whom the medical practitioner reasonably believes to be infected with HIV infection. So to the spouse, former spouse or other contact of the infected person or to a health officer for the purpose of making the disclosure to the spouse, former spouse, or other contact. So I'll leave you to read the entire uh, provision as well.